Next up, we have Stuart Lamont, who is going to be showing us simplifying level one tasks to reduce escalation. So Stuart is the Apple Infrastructure Administrator at Ivanhoe Grammar School. Um, several years experience in Apple Breakfix, um, as well as ACTC and JAMP certifications. Um, over the past three years, Stuart's changed the face of Mac OS deployment at Ivanhoe Grammar School. He's an active member of Melbourne Apple Admins community and has a keen interest in automating and simplifying help desk tasks. Now, this is Stuart's first time presenting at XWorld, so thank you, Stuart. Away you go. Morning, everyone. Thank you, Marcus. I hope not all of you are nursing nasty hangovers right now, so um, I won't make you think too hard. Uh, um, so, I kind of called this talk a, a tale of automation, and, and that tale was me attempting to be funny. It, obviously, you know, I hear a giggle, so thank you, thank you. Um, so really what I want to talk about is uh, a couple of things that we've done to solve some problems uh, within our environment that were essentially every Mac coming through the door, and me being the only Mac tech. I was servicing every single one of them. And that was starting to become a little bit unwieldy, and so uh, we needed to find some solutions to that. So in our environment, we have uh, a little bit over 500 Macs and uh, a little bit over 650-odd uh, iOS devices, uh, and that's both uh, BYOD and school-issued devices. And we also have about 2,300 users. The first part uh, of uh, solving these kind of level one problems getting escalated is to really uh, leverage self-service uh, to kind of do what it says on the box and encourage our users to serve themselves. We're using self-service also in, uh, for our level one techs to, uh, when they're working with a client or if they're working out in the workshop, uh, we have some policies there scoped so that when they log in with their IT account, they have a couple of policies available only to them. It does help if you can educate your users that self-service is there and also to make it compelling. Um, so this screenshot here is uh, what our techs see on the help desk category when they log in. Um, because it's a static screenshot, you can't see that I got excited when I found out that GIFs are supported in uh, self-service, so that was... <laughs> um, so there's some simple policies and config profiles just in there um, for staff to kind of troubleshoot themselves um, so they, they can do a recon, etc. Um, or even a basic computer maintenance, which is pretty much just restart the computer and flush the cache. We're also leveraging Jamf Helper to uh, remind our users about a couple of uh, computer maintenance or account maintenance tasks that they can do. Um, and so uh, we once a month run the item on the right, suggesting that they back up their computer. And then uh, right before school holidays, because of our password expiry policies, um, obviously it's not going to be great for our academics or our students to have their password expire halfway through the holidays keychains break and all of that. I'm sure you're all familiar with that problem. And so uh, just last week before school holidays started, I pushed out the reminder on the left to just remind them, hey, change your password before it's too late. So in addition to self-service, uh, we're regularly using uh, five custom tools that we've built in-house or I built in-house. And I'm going to unpack each of these tools today um, just give you a brief overview of what we're doing. Um, a lot of these tools were built as a hack to make the problem go away. Uh, the intention, of course, being to fix the hackiness later. That hasn't happened yet. So rather than a, this being a, a prescription of what to do or what you can do, what I'm really hoping to do is kind of give you guys some ideas on problems that you can solve in your own environments and um, you know, maybe we can collaborate on some of those thoughts later. So the tools I want to talk about is Outlook for Mac Signature, 
login script, backup script, our BYO doing onboarding script, and a takeoff domain script. As you can tell, my naming conventions are highly imaginative. Um, yeah, I, I really like having, having it do what it says on the box. It's, it's, um, it's very helpful. Now, four of these five scripts are routinely only ever run by our help desk engineers. Um, we wouldn't normally get an end user to run them. Uh, that being said, we, we probably could if we educated them a little bit. So some of you might be thinking, well, why automate these tasks? Like, they're all pretty straightforward, right? Well, yeah, but your day might look a little bit like mine. It, that goes on for a while. So we've, so we've got constant interruptions, or maybe you want to simplify things so that you don't get absolutely every job escalated to you. Um, as I said, being the only Mac tech, we got a lot of things coming over, uh, just being escalated because people were scared because it had an apple on the back of it. So you, you might notice that the theory section of the XKCD comic here, that's the goal, that's the dream. The reality is not always that, but you know, we, we deal with that. And so sometimes when I'm solving these problems, this quote from the uh, limousine challenge of Top Gear comes into mind uh, because these are really just ingenious solutions to problems that just shouldn't have existed. Um, and then for some of the other problems that I'm solving, there's that. <laughs> so most of, these, uh, most of these scripts are actually written in, in Apple script. And some of you are thinking, ew. And others are going, why? Well, because I have no formal programming training. And it, the, the cost of entry for AppleScript is really easy. And I know that there's probably a few of you out there who are probably in the same boat that I was when I got started. And the cost of entry for AppleScript is, is really low. Um, and that was, that was really helpful. Yes, I probably could have used Cocoa Dialog and Bash to get the nice pretty UI elements. Um, and in some cases, I'm starting to do that now. But I also needed to interface with some apps. And um, the OSA frameworks um, really helped with that. And lastly, AppleScript is there. And it's easy. So let's dive in. Um, Outlook for Mac Signature is one of the first uh, First scripts I wrote at Ivanhoe. Um, and all it really is, is an Apple script that injects the HTML signature into Outlook for Mac. I've bundled that as an Apple script uh, dot app bundle. And uh, packaged and deployed it using Casper into the utilities folder. The reason I'm putting it in the utilities folder is because this is the one of those five scripts I spoke about that end users will actually run themselves. So why automate signature creation? So when I first started with the school um, in 2014, I was a contractor there and I was only spending 15 hours a week at the school. 2015 was our centenary year. And so the marketing team wanted to create all of this content around our centenary, you know, lots of gold, um, you know, all of the marketing material, including the, the mail signatures. The Windows text had Exclaimer to push out the uh, email signatures to all of our Windows users. And at that time, we only had around about 120 or so Macs on the network, but it did mean that every single one of those would have required the manual setup of those signatures. And in 15 hours a week, I didn't want to spend three weeks doing that. I'm a little bit lazy like that, you might think, but <laughs> we'll go, and go into that later. So, of course, after 2015, we got our 2016 marketing and signature. And then uh, for 2017, we had a slight redesign of the logo, different, uh, different tagline, and um, some kind of 
cleaner HTML there. Those are really blurry. Or my eyes are bad. Probably that. And so who knows what's out there for 2018? I haven't received the email from marketing yet that we're doing an, another signature, so. So how does it work? What does it do? How does the magic happen? So I managed to get the HTML from our web devs and um, so that I could kind of pull it apart and work it out. And it turns out the HTML formatting requirements for Exclaimer are pretty loose. Like, they don't seem to put the tags in the right spot, but they still display fine. As soon as you put that into a Mac, it all turns to custard. And so I had, had a little bit of a challenge fixing some of that up. Um, the script also then does a, uh, so it does a disk lookup um, to pull the relevant info from AD. Unfortunately, this means that if your AD binding is busted, it doesn't work. Uh, it will prompt a user to uh, pick up info that's maybe not reliably stored in Active Directory. Uh, so, uh, for example, the campus that they're based at um, to select the correct address on their signature. Um, the OSA framework then creates the new signature and injects the HTML. Um, and those OSA frameworks make that part easy because all you do is tell application Microsoft Outlook, create new signature with content, blah. It's, it's pretty easy. And um, finally, the user actually has to manually select their default signature in Outlook because what I was doing when I first wrote this in 2014, the lens cap's on, Tony. When I first wrote this in 2014, <laughs> Um, I was able to trick the TCC database into allowing me to automatically select those um, default signatures by using some kind of automator trickery. Uh, but unfortunately, SIP then broke the way I was injecting the permissions into the TCC database. Um, so here's a, a quick video of it in action. So you'll see that um, we open the preferences and there's no signatures there. We run our Outlook for Mac script. We select which campus we're at. And then we've got the, the signature there. And the user then just has to select the default signatures so that when they create a new email, they've now got the correct signature. Um, those those images take a little while to load uh, sometimes, especially when you're first creating uh, an email, just because they're coming down from a web, uh, a web host, which uh, for some reason trying to embed them into the HTML was painful. Uh, yeah, different story. Uh, I was able to try uh, embed them using Base64, but then when I sent those to a Windows machine, it all broke and they couldn't decode them. So there's a few things I'd really love to do better with Outlook for Mac script. Um, so what's next? Well, I'd love to combine it with uh, Talking Moose's Outlook Exchange setup script, which we're also using to uh, simplify the setup of our devices. I'd love to turn this into a Cocoa app and, you know, pie in the sky kind of dream here. I'd, I'd create a network listener to just push the config centrally. That would be fantastic. Um, and if I can find a way to uh, automate the selection of that default signature, uh, which moving to the Cocoa app might help me there to get uh, added to the accessibility database. Because, sad face. The next one uh, is login script. Um, and so, unsurprisingly, it does what it says on the box. Uh, it's another AppleScript.app bundle, um, but this time it comes with a launch agent. Um, and it maps the user's share points on login to uh, mimic their Windows environment as closely as possible. We had a lot of users who um, transitioned from PC to Mac, and so I cloned the, uh, the uh, login.bat files 
uh, from the PC environment as, as closely as I could. So I've just answered this question, but why do it? So first, uh, first problem is user-based 802.1x certificates. Those certs obviously mean that when you log into the computer, you're not immediately connected to Wi-Fi. So that takes a couple of minutes. And so I deliberately built a delay in at the very beginning to wait about 30 seconds, and then it'll try and ping one of the servers internally. And if it gets a positive response back, then it starts the process of connecting. And it does that check five times before then just going, no, see you later, I'll try again later. Also, we had, as I said before, that large number of users migrating across from a PC. Um, and I'm not sure how many of you work in education. Yeah. So you guys work closely with academics, right? Academics um, tend to not enjoy change particularly much. And so this concept of, well, where's my Z drive? Uh, well, that's your home drive now, so that's got your name on it. That, they struggled with that, and they also struggled with not knowing how to mount that using their full UNC path and command K. And so obviously we wanted to simplify that process for the end user. And so creating this login script uh, uh, coupled with the launch agent meant that the end user doesn't have to do anything. They log into their computer and their drives are mapped. So the other thing you probably know if you work with academics um, and students and anyone is that they don't ever sleep, uh, they don't ever shut their device down, they just close the lid, put it to sleep. And so the built-in AD plugin obviously doesn't kind of work when you wake from sleep to then remount the, the network shares in the SMB home. So that was kind of a problem. And so to solve that problem, uh, I added into the launch agent a, a periodic re-trigger re um, of the, the login script. And uh, lastly, what I did with the Apple script bundle, the app bundle, is uh, I've modified the info.plist to make that app run silently. So it doesn't create a dock icon and it doesn't draw focus from whatever the user's running, especially if they're running full screen. If your user's running in class, they're playing a video from their laptop to the projector, they don't want the timer on the launch agent to come up and then pull focus away from that video. That's kind of annoying. We ran into that problem a few times before I worked out how to solve that problem. So how does this one work? So again, we're doing a disk lookup to pull the uh, SMB home and pull the um, group memberships. Because it's Apple script, there's a very unwieldy if statement to then go, if you're a member of this group, mount these drives. Um, unfortunately, Apple script doesn't include a case statement, so uh, that caused that problem. I've also, I'm also mounting the volumes wrapped in a try catch uh, block so that uh, we shouldn't end up producing error messages that prompt the user to, hey, there was a problem. You know, if they don't have permissions to a SharePoint, et cetera, we shouldn't then be drawing focus and um, presenting odd error messages that don't make any sense. Shouldn't. Um, so here's a video of it in action. Um, so we've got our nice, beautiful splash screen saying, hey, use of this computer. We'll log in and I've just blurred out the number of characters in my password so you can't see it and guess it. I may have sped up the login process a little bit. <laughs> just a shade. And so once we see the desktop, we start to see those populate on the right hand side there. So what's next for login script? Again, there's stuff I want to do better. Um, well, the good news is I've just started uh, testing the Python version of this, um, and so far it works. It needs a little bit of fine-tuning and tweaking, 
um, but should be ready to go soon. I'm muddling my way through Python and uh, Tony's workshop on Wednesday was actually really helpful um, to wrap my head around some stuff, even though I got lost um, halfway through. Um, but uh, Tony create, uh, gave us some good resources to, to refer to there. So the other thing we've been speaking about internally is to join the 21st century and start leveraging the cloud services that we already have at our disposal. We are using Google Apps for schools in our primary school and we also have um, Office 365 with OneDrive available. So those kind of concepts uh, may end up rendering uh, all of this script completely obsolete. And then, of course, the last option is uh, Nomad, and I'm looking forward to Joel's presentation later um, on Nomad to see if that can solve my problem. And two thumbs up, yep, it can solve my problem. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Uh, so then we come to backup script, and um, hey, guess what? does what it says on the box, right? So uh, I use the Apple script here again to mount some predefined network shares uh, to back, uh, so that we have uh, some predefined network shares on each of our campuses. Um, and we'll, I've built the script so that you can actually customize this. Uh, again, it's an Apple, uh, Apple script wrapper and we're essentially just doing an rsync command. And I've built it with the excludes flag in rsync so that you can decide to exclude music, movies, pictures, uh, Google Drive, Dropbox, etc. cetera. Uh, it's probably worth noting, uh, so we built this with the two locations and two account types. So we have our Ridgeway campus and our Plenty campus, and then our two account types, obviously staff and students. It's worth noting that we wouldn't expect our end users to run this script. Um, this would generally be run by our L1 help desk staff. And so well, why, why script this? Well, um, most of our level one staff really don't have a lot of Mac OS experience, as I mentioned before. And so I wanted to reduce that, those number of times where I was intervening just to do a backup of a device. Um, this also then means that our level one techs don't actually need to log in to the users folder because we're doing the rsync with administrative privileges. It just means that they can point it to whatever user account they want to back up, even if they're logged in as the generic IT account, um, and it'll just rsync the whole thing. And also our level one techs aren't well versed in the command line. I don't want them to have to then write a very long rsync command with all the flags for exclusions, etc. Um, this just makes it so much easier and streamlines the process. So how does it work? Um, so it's all wrapped in a .app bundle and placed in the utilities folder on each machine and we deploy that using Casper as well. Um, the script begins with a warning to uh, connect to Ethernet. We then get prompted to select the account that they want to back up, uh, then select the location that where we're actually physically at and what the account type is. The script then mounts the backup SharePoint and runs the rsync with admin privileges, literally in Apple script, it's with administrator privileges at the end of the line. So easy. That's why I chose it. <laughs> um, so then the, the user that's running it will be prompted for admin credentials. And then at the moment, this rsync kind of runs silently, um, which is a problem that I'm trying to solve um, potentially with Cocoa Dialog, uh, but you'll see that in a minute. Um, when, we, uh, when we actually select the student account type, um, I'm building in exclusions of music, movies, uh, Google Drive, Dropbox, Parallels, those kinds of things, because I don't particularly want to back up all of the students' um, illegally downloaded movies. I don't want to back up um, you know, all of their pictures. As far as I'm concerned, they're responsible for that data. 
Um, and there's probably some edge cases where that could be said to be you know, school relevant, but in most cases it's not. Uh, in the case of staff, we just back up their whole folder regardless of what's in there. So, um, so here's a video of it in action. Um, maybe, yep, there we go. So in the utilities folder, uh, we've got backup script there. Um, and there's a little bit of a spoiler here. Uh, we've got restore script as well that does the inverse. Imaginative naming, as I said. So we get our prompt, hey, it's recommended to plug into Ethernet. We get a list to choose the user account. We'll choose IT here. And are we at Ridgeway or are we at Plenty? Ridgeway and staff or student. So then it takes a moment or so and we should see, come on, there we go. So we've got our SharePoint and then we get a prompt to say this is where we're going to back up to. We're prompted for our admin credentials and again hide the password. Don't want anyone guessing the number of characters. And so uh, then we get backup complete after a period of X, where X can be any number. And so this is, uh, this is obviously the problem, that gap after you click OK and there's no kind of dialogue. On the, in that case, that backup only took about a minute and a half because the IT account on these devices has no data in it. Um, unfortunately, on a user device, and we tested this, I think we had a situation on Monday where we actually used it, uh, it took about four hours. So obviously, the screen's not doing anything, you're not getting any feedback, that's, that's a little bit of a problem. So that leads us into what's next. Well, you saw that Restore Script is there um, to kind of reverse this process, so that's done. I am trying to nut out how to uh, create the progress bar on uh, using Cocoa Dialog, and it might end up just being an intermediate, uh, indeterminate, sorry, uh, progress bar to begin with. And um, following on from that, I have actually started working on uh, turning this into a Cocoa app where you can uh, select the uh, select the folders that you want, select the location, and have that single pane of glass instead of. AppleScript prompt, followed by AppleScript prompt, followed by AppleScript prompt. Um, so then there's this unknown step in the middle, and then profit. Probably not, but again, I'm trying to be funny, so, you know, <laughs> and it's not working. The next tool I want to talk about is our uh, OSM onboarding script. So OSM, uh, we call BYODs OSMs that for out of school machine. It's just a different language really. So uh, in year 11 and 12, uh, students at Ivanhoe have the option of continuing to use the computer that they got issued in year nine, which is at this point always a PC. And after two years, if you've ever worked with high school students, it's probably not worthwhile trying to uh, keep that thing running. Uh, or they can purchase a new computer through the school uh, and they get an option of a Mac or a PC at that point. Or they can BYOD, go to JB Hi-Fi, you know, pick up whatever's nice. Sometimes they might get a better deal. Um, or they get given one for Christmas, that kind of thing. It's a private school. So, uh, so the process here used to be pretty complicated and time consuming uh, for our IT staff. So the users would drop in their computer and we'd probably have it for about a day um, to install the Casper suite, install our, uh, oh, sorry, the Jamf agent, um, install our uh, kind of required software, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so by scripting and automating as much of this process as possible, uh, we can now actually onboard a BYOD device uh, to our specifications in about 30 minutes. Uh, and that's including the user initiated enrollment time, which is probably one of the longer parts of the process. And then following on, there's also the, the process of setting up the user's outlook um, and setting up uh, the, the user's individual account, which I'm not really going to go into um, in this presentation. Um, 
So what do we do here? So first of all, we need to enrol the device using, um, using user-initiated enrollment. And then we run a self-service policy. So it's just in that help desk, in that help desk category and self-service. And the first thing it does is it um, runs a bash script um, for the IT staff member to put in a computer name so that the AD bind will work. Um, this computer name needs to exist in Active Directory for the AD bind to work because we're using a service account that has no privileges except for bind. Um, I, I use a bash script and I, I'm actually using a, a bash Apple script wrapper to pull this, uh, to get this dialog box and pull that in. I probably could have used Cocoa Dialog again, but it seemed overkill. And then I already, I know that OSA script will be available on every device that comes through the door. I don't have to push Cocoa Dialog on enrollment complete. Uh, the policy installs some school specific software. Um, it creates our local admin account. It runs a couple of scripts like setting the time zone and um, putting the uh, NTP, uh, pointing the NTP service to our domain controller so that we don't end up with Kerberos clock skew problems. Um, and there's a little bit more to do after they log in, but uh, following this, it cascades over to another policy to run an Active Directory binding. So there's a bit more after this, so we have to log in as the user account, um, as the end user, set up their Outlook, set up all the other things that they need, some school-specific shortcuts, et cetera. Again, I've got a video of it in action. So uh, we've just finished the, uh, the user-initiated enrollment. We'll open up self-service and log in and blow my password. Head over to the help desk category and join OSM to IGS network. So we click that and we get asked to enter a computer name. In this case, we'll just click OK. And I've sped it up, as you can see, from the GIFs that are going insane. So we then get a uh, Jamf display message um, to check the AD bind has been successful, and also to uh, then log in as the user and complete the setup. So lastly, the last tool that I really want to talk about is um, our takeoff domain script. Um, this tool is probably the one that made our help desk techs the most excited. At the end of our year, tw uh, year 12, our students get to keep their computer. They've paid for it through their school fees, so it's theirs as far as we're concerned. Um, or it was a BYOD to begin with. So when they finish, we want to turn it back into a computer that can actually be used in the real world. They might end up going to a university that wants to install their own Jamf binaries, et cetera, or they might end up needing to bind to a different Active Directory, although I pray that they don't. Um, but the other, uh, the other thing, of course, is that they, they might still want to keep some of their data. Now, before this script got created, what we were doing, um, and it's, it still makes me shudder to this day, was we were getting the user to back up their own data. It's your data, you're responsible. Uh, and then we would bring the machine in and factory reset it back to an out-of-box experience. We still to this day do this with our PC devices to just restore it back to factory defaults and then they get a Windows education license. With the Macs, uh, what we were able to achieve with this script is um, you know, we no longer restore to factory defaults. The user doesn't actually have to back up their data because we're not touching their user account and it's no longer as time consuming. We used to have the machine in for at least a day. We can now actually run this process with the user at the front desk in about 10 minutes. And um, that's especially good for students who are about to head into university. They didn't bother to come in in December before they left the school to get the machine taken off the domain. They've kind of worked it out in you know February, March that they probably should get the school software removed. And so they don't want to leave the computer with us for a day and then have to come back. That this is their only interaction with the school since they've left. You know, giving them a, a quick, easy experience and also you know, not having to have the tech spend a lot of time on it because they're no longer a student. We don't really have to service them, do we? Yes, we do. 
Um, and so uh, what and how does it work? And there's a lot to kind of cover here because there's a lot happening in the background. Uh, so it's a self-service triggered bash script. So this script just lives in, in the JSS um, and it gets triggered by a self-service policy or a custom trigger that I've um, set up as well. The uh, first thing it does is it sends an email to me uh, to remind me to then remove the computer record from the JSS just to keep the, data, the database tidy. Uh, it then, uh, so the, uh, the Jamf policy to uninstall the Adobe suite and a couple of other programs gets triggered. Um, so again, I've just got a custom trigger with uninstall Adobe and a couple of other custom triggers to uninstall other products. Uh, it pulls our Wi-Fi profiles, force unbinds from AD, removes the software licenses for Office and Parallels if it's installed. Uh, we do an RMRF of all of our um, Ivanhoe custom tools, so the, uh, the four that I've spoken about before, um, and also to remove the launch agents. And then we trigger a, another uh, Jamf policy to remove the management account. Then we trigger a Jamf remove framework so that we've now removed the Jamf binaries, etc. And then we bounce the machine. So I don't have a video of this one, but um, this quote, I joked before about um, being a lazy admin, but the truth of the matter is that I'm a busy admin. Um, as you saw before, those constant interruptions. This has definitely helped to reduce the number of those uh, coming through because at the end of the day, when someone comes up and says, hey, Stu, how do I do this? It's like, well, it's in self-service. Um, and you know, all of that being said, this quote from Bill Gates is not, uh, not true. Um, you know, I think a little bit of laziness in admin is probably a good thing because you'll find better ways to do, do stuff. And uh, it was once said to me that lazy admin is good admin. At the end of the day though, my goal with these five tools is really to empower our level one techs to actually achieve results for our users without having to you know, go, hey, hang on a second, I'll just ask someone who actually knows what they're doing. And the benefit, of course, to me is that I reduce the number of escalated tickets in my queue. Um, I should probably give a little bit of context for this, um, this image. Uh, the last time I presented on any of this stuff was at the Melbourne Apple admins meeting on May the 4th. Um, there were a lot more Star Wars memes built in to this presentation before, but you know, I figured it's not May the 4th, so I'll pull some of them out. But I had to leave this one in there. So some of you are probably thinking, well, how do I get started? Well, this is how I work, and uh, you might choose a different workflow. Uh, the first hurdle is obviously to identify the tasks that you can actually simplify and automate. We then need to analyze and plan for those. So how are we gonna, how are we gonna attack that? You might need to, uh, you might already know the tasks that you wanna automate, and how you might want to do them, uh, but for others you might want to uh, look at your help desk analytics to, to get that. The next step is going to be to code. Uh, this one's a choose your own adventure, um, Bash, Python, AppleScript, Swift, whatever works for you and whatever's going to work for your, your use case. Uh, the next step is really test, and I learned this the hard way. Don't do what I did, don't test on 500 machines. Um, and then of course we're gonna fix those bugs and then test again. Um, the second iteration of test is not optional. And then we'll package and deploy that. That's, that's about as prescriptive as I'm gonna get. Like you can chop and change this as much as you want, but that's how I work. You might choose to work differently. So to give you a little bit of a summary, you know, a, a task doesn't have to be hard for it to be worthy of automating. Simple tasks like a, a backup or formatting an Excel spreadsheet or those kinds of things 
can provide you with um, some repeatable, you know, reliable results. Um, and there's an asterisk there because, you know, there's outside factors that might come into play. And simple tasks are really easy to automate and a great place to get started. Um, so I really want to ask, what are you going to automate? So um, if you want to contact me or get any of the, um, any of the stuff that I've shown here today, um, my details are there. So there's my WordPress blog, uh, aussieapplenerd.wordpress.com. If you're not already a member of the Mac Admin Slack channel, um, I'm surprised Marcus hasn't already said this 15 times, please join. Um, you'll find me on there as uh, Stu Lamont. I am always in the Mac, ANS Mac channel, um, being quite distracting. All of this stuff is on my uh, GitHub there, uh, github.com DJ Stewie, and I'm also on Twitter. Now, I'm looking at the timer and it's flashing red, and Tony's almost flashing red, so I should probably finish up. I, would, I was going to ask some questions. I thought I was going to have time, but apparently not. So uh, thank you guys, and uh, I hope that helps. Hope you got something out of it.